that's as good as far as you can take it. Uh, welcome, thank you for coming uh, to this CREES event. My name is Jadja Tundritsky, I'm director of uh, CREES, the Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies, I'm professor of sociology, and I'm very pleased to, to start uh, a mini-series of events focusing on Ukraine. So we have today's lecture um, that CREES is hosting. We're also co-hosting another event in the Islamic department uh, tomorrow, and uh, next week we have a round table on uh, Ukraine now. We have one of our speakers here in the room, Oksana Manetro, who is going to be also that roundtable that will examine the current affairs, current issues, ongoing issues um, in Ukraine. And today we're very pleased to have with us Professor uh, Vitaly Chernetsky, who's Associate Professor of Slavic Languages and Literatures and Director of the Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies at the University of Kansas. So we, I know how busy <laughs> you must be. So thank you for coming. Um, he has published widely on Russian and Ukrainian literature and film. His uh, book, Mapping Post-Communist Cultures, Russia and Ukraine in the Context of Globalization, which was published uh, in 2007 with McGill Queen's University Press, was translated into Ukrainian in 2013, which is always actually a big deal when uh, your work is translated into the language of the society you're studying, so congratulations. Um, and a volume of selected, selected writings in Ukrainian was also, uh, is also forthcoming in Ukrainian uh, and to be published in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, Professor Chernetsky has also co-edited an anthology of contemporary Russian poetry in English translation, Crossing Centuries in 2000, a bilingual anthology of contemporary Ukrainian poetry, Letters from Ukraine in 2016, and an annotated Ukra Ukrainian translation of Edward Said's Culture and Imperialism in 2007. While his work is translated into Ukrainian, he himself is an accomplished translator. His translations uh, include Yuri and Ruhovich novel, The Moscoviad and Twelve Circles, and a volume of selected poems entitled Songs for a Dead Booster. Professor Chernetsky is also past president of the American Association for Ukrainian Studies, and currently serves as vice, pres vice president of the Shevchenko Scientific Study, uh, Society excuse me, in the US. Uh, today, he will be speaking on the language politics of post-Soviet Ukrainian cinema, from unreflective confusion up to strategic multi multilingualism. Please join me in welcoming the position. Thank you so much, Olivier, for this generous introduction. Uh, and my big thanks to uh, all the colleagues here at the University of Michigan in Greece and the Slavic department especially for the kind invitation and making my visit possible. Delighted to be here. It's my first time in Ann Arbor, and so far, even though it's been gray and grisly outside, I've had a very warm <laughs> welcome. So thank you. And uh, today, uh, what I'm presenting will be a bit of a, a panorama of uh, language politics in Ukrainian cinema during the whole history of filmmaking, but with a special focus on contemporary trends. So. Uh, uh, where I think it would, uh, let's see, let's advance our presentation. So you see there's the title. And, I'm oh, sorry? Microphone. Oh, yes. Uh, thank you. I should have done this earlier. And it's green. Do I need to re-say <laughs> what I just no, no. said? <laughs> no, 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 okay, not. all right. Okay, sorry about that. So, uh, language and cinema have uh, an interesting and complicated relationship. Of course, uh, for the first uh, quarter of century plus of its existence, cinema was silent, and uh, the presence of language was either through intertitles or through lip reading. And of course, in those situations, you know, with exceptions of lip reading, intertitles were very easily changeable, uh, which is, uh, resulted in the fact that uh, cinema pr proliferated very widely as a popular medium. And in fact, because a very large part of uh, early silent film audiences were the urban working class, the urban poor, many 
of whom were not necessarily highly literate. In fact, the verbal presence on cinema was of minimal contents. Uh, but with the arrival of sound uh, in the late 1920s in the US and by the early 1930s in most countries of the world, including the Soviet Union, this brought a very interesting series of changes that have to do with language politics and national identity. Because all of a sudden, exporting films from one country to another became very difficult. And you had to uh, also figure out how do you render uh, speech in another language in a film you're going to show in one another country. And right away, there arose two distinct cultures that continue uh, struggling with each other and having their ups and downs around the world. And that is dubbing versus subtitling speech in other languages. And there, here in the United States, most foreign language films that are shown are usually subtitled, with the exception of uh, films that intend to reach a really wide audience, like cartoons, for example, uh, uh, or uh, kung fu fighter movies. Uh, but even in those cases, you then have releases of those films in two alternative versions with the subtitles for a serious art house viewer who appreciates uh, Shaolin Soccer or Spirited Away for their filmmaking work as opposed to the commercial mass appeal and those who just want to have a good time watching a film. So at least in the privacy of your own home on a Blu-ray and DVD, you have that choice. Or in the movie theaters, you can go sometimes into a subtitled versus uh, dubbed version. But in most countries, most places around the world, you do not have that luxury. You are either offered a subtitled version or offered a uh, dubbed version. Sometimes it's even a combination of the two. For example, in Scandinavian countries, you sometimes will see a film that is dubbed in English, which is then subtitled in Norwegian. Sorry, there's nothing to repeat. <laughs> 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 Wonderful. Thank you, computer. <laughs> so uh, I have here the cases of Italy and France. And Italy and France are important for us for two reasons. These are the countries which, of course, we, which we revere greatly for their cinematic artistry, for their contribution for innovation in world cinema. And both Italy and France are countries where dubbing is absolutely prevalent where subtitling of films is very, very rare. And this is something that arose and became very prominent in uh, the context of the 1930s and had indeed distinct uh, implications in terms of national identity and state politics. So even though France in the 1930s was a democratic country and Italy, of course, was a fascist state ruled by Mussolini, both of them embraced the dubbing cultures, the high art dubbing cultures. So in both countries, dubbing is considered a high art, a very respectable profession. And uh, this was seen as a way of to, uh, to create a stronger national identity. In other words, already then they were worried about the potentially pernicious impact of Hollywood and its industry of dreams and wanted to forestall that and make sure that even if people watch those Hollywood blockbusters, they watch them in French or Italian and therefore this nurtures local culture and in fact generates uh, income which helps bring those films to the local audiences. What happened in the Soviet Union was uh, slightly different and this is something that is important for us to bear in mind in that the arrival of sound coincided with the end of the new economic policy with the so-called Great Break, uh, the uh, state-driven uh, forced industrialization uh, of uh, the cities, collectivization of agriculture, and the so-called Cultural Revolution. And uh, 
the end of pluralism that characterized the art during the 1920s era. So we have a major ideological shift that accompanies a technological change in the case of the film industry. And so what happens is importing films grinds to a halt in 1930. In the 1920s, and this is something what a lot of silent uh, filmmakers uh, from the Soviet Union bemoaned, uh, for instance, uh, you can see that in uh, Vyartov's Man with the movie camera, is that the audiences, those uh, hegemons of the revolution, the working class, did not go to see proper revolutionary films and tended to go and watch uh, enjoyable entertainment that was imported from the US, from Weimar Germany, or from other countries. And so in uh, Man with the Movie Camera, the poster focuses on this green Manuela, which is uh, some sort of tawdry film that was shown in a Soviet cinema. So the cinema is Soviet, but there is a pernicious influence of Western cinematic junk food that the filmmaker is trying to fight against. Obviously, with the introduction of sound, uh, importation of these foreign films uh, stops and grinds to a halt. And oh, it conveniently also does so for ideological reasons. Of course, there is no technology to introduce uh, sound projection on all the movie theaters simultaneously, so it takes quite a long time. And for a while, they continue showing those silent films from the 1920s, but no new ones are imported by the Soviet state. In films that are released in the Soviet Union in sound versions whenever there is foreign dialogue, for example, in uh, uh, Grigory Alexandrov's musical Circus, it is subtitled, it is not dubbed. And uh, the first uh, film to be dubbed and released, the first Western film to be dubbed and released in the Soviet Union, interestingly, was James Whale's The Invisible Man, you see the poster. Uh, the film was released in the US in 1933, and uh, it took them four years to dub it and release in the Soviet Union. But it was such a rare exception that it confirms the rule. Foreign films were, sound films were by and large not seen in the Soviet Union in the 1930s. And uh, if it was done, it, they were dubbed into Russian only. And Soviet dubbing of foreign films continued to be only into Russian until the late 1950s when first attempts to dub films into other languages uh, were done. And again, when the foreign languages were done in Soviet films, they tended to be subtitled rather than dubbed. So what happened to sound films in Ukraine? Here are examples of two great films which inaugurated sound cinema in Ukrainian film production. I just mentioned Ziga Vyartov earlier. Uh, Ziga Vyartov uh, is a person who was a Soviet filmmaker, but whose background was anything but Russian. He's a uh, Jewish uh, in terms of uh, cultural background. He was born in what is now Poland, and he did work in Russia for a while, but some of his best and most influential work was accomplished uh, when he was working in Ukraine, including Man with a Movie Camera and Enthusiasm, which is the film he made immediately after Man with a Movie Camera. So Ukraine is where Vyartov's transition from silent to sound cinema happens. And Enthusiasm, which of course you can see here, uh, the poster is in Ukrainian. Moreover, it is in Kharkivsky Pravopis. It's in the uh, scholarly a Ukrainian orthography that was introduced in the late 1920s, then under Stalin was then banned, and uh, uh, Ukrainian orthography was artificially drawn closer to the Russian orthography. So, but in Vyartov's film, what we have is just ambient sounds. We have some speech, but it plays uh, no diegetic uh, role. It's just overheard speech in the background. We have noises of construction and industry. So sound there, I mean, it's basically, this film is a one, no, over an hour long music video, if you wish. It's where the video prevails over the noise, but the logic of composition is very similar. Then, uh, Oksandr Dovzhenko, the great uh, filmmaker, you know, the founder of poetic cinema tradition in the Soviet context and 
arguably the greatest Ukrainian filmmaker ever. His first sound film, Ivan, which was released in 1932, uh, and Lilia Kaganovsky from University of Illinois just published a wonderful book on early sound cinema in the Soviet Union, where this is one of the films that she discusses. In his case, we have what a linguist called non-accommodating bilingualism. In other words, there are some characters who speak Ukrainian. There are other characters who speak Russian. Their speech is not subtitled or dubbed. And they carry on the conversation when one party speaks in one language and the other party switches in the other language without switching into the language of the interlocutor, hence non-accommodating bilingualism. Two people speak, and they maintain the language that they're more comfortable speaking in. Uh, this, of course, in the context of uh, Soviet Ukraine was relatively easy to understand for the audiences who knew both languages, but if you know only one language and not the other, um, those languages are quite different from each other even though they're both Slavic, this can create difficulties. So these are examples of where th things stood early on. Later in with the solidification of Stalinist control on the film industry, there were very few films that were released in Ukrainian only. In the 1930s, these were mostly films that were musicals. And in the case of uh, Ukraine, uh, these were not the so-called collective form of Korhoz musicals of Ivan Pudyev, which are set in Ukraine, but filmed in Russia. These were the films based on operas, uh, most famously, Kovaridza's Natalka Poltavka. So uh, a staged, full-fledged cinematic version of an opera, which is sung in Ukrainian, and therefore is in Ukrainian. Most of the other films are made in Russian. And it is only in the Thaw era, in the post-Stalin period, that we see finally a breakthrough in the case uh, of uh, diversity and innovation. And then again, as uh, you will see shortly in my uh, remarks, a retreat during the 1970s, early 1980s. One of the reasons the uh, language politics and cinema was so fraught is that Soviet Union, of course, there was a censorship system. So the film had to be approved by censors. And in order to be approved by censors on the all union level, the film had to exist in a Russian language uh, so that the censors there would be able to understand it. So what happened as a result is if a film was made in a language other than Russian in the context of the Soviet Union, whether it was Ukrainian, uh, Armenian, Georgian, Kazakh, Kyrgyz, or other, there had to be a Russian language version. Sometimes it was artistically, professionally dubbed, Sometimes there will be just one monotone voice uh, in the Russian that is overlaying the dialogue in another language. A practice that continued, of course, in pirated uh, Western films in the 1990s, where often people would even pitch their noses so that their voices would not be recognized. <laughs> and in a very monotone uh, way, they would say, I love you, I love you madly, kiss me now, please go <laughs> on. The same. Uh, obviously, voiceover reader reading for all the characters in the film and the same boring monotone voices. So we have the question of censorship, and we still have the question of popular versus art cinema. So here, too, we see a continuing challenge of whether a film is for a wide audience, uh, and or whether the film is for the aesthete gour gourmet tastes of cinematic consumption. And very often that would determine which version of dubbing or even occasional very rare cases transliterating we would have. And of course, most of the popular cinema was dubbed into Russian only. So examples would be, uh, for example, Indian melodramas like Sita and Gita, who those who grew up in the Soviet Union would remember as a very popular film, which was much loved in non-Russian parts of the Soviet Union. They were hugely popular in Central Asia. They were very popular in Western Ukraine. But of course, they watched those Indian melodramas dubbed into Russian. 
but uh, the question of censorship also runs with the question of economics. For the Soviet Union film industry, even though movie tickets were incredibly cheap, was still a major source of extra income. They wanted people to go to the movie theaters. It was an important uh, source of supplemental income. And for people, of course, it was one of the few places where in the dark in the movie theaters you had relative privacy where you could hold hands or uh, whisper to a friend, uh, things of that kind. So the movie theaters, movie going played a very important role in uh, the country during those years. But from the production, from the economic side, making a film in a language other than Russian meant also extra expenditures. It meant that you had to spend money on um, making two different language versions, and this some, sometimes was seen as not cost effective. So it's not just ideological pressures, but also uh, economic pressures that uh, very much impacted that. So here are two key cases from the 1960s that will give us examples of the policy of language use. Zadvomazaitsyame, chasing after two hairs, a very popular uh, uh, comedy from the early 1960s, and Shadows of Forgotten Ancestors by Parajanov, uh, a major breakthrough, a film that uh, won nearly 30 awards at international festivals, a film that made Parajanov an international celebrity and considered equal to the leading innovative filmmakers around the world. A uh, very important gesture by Parajanov was to refuse dubbing into Russian. His film was uh, released in the Ukrainian only, and moreover, this was not standard Ukrainian, but it was the spoken vernacular of the places where the film was filmed. There are very sparse intertitles, but the intertitles are also in Ukrainian. The film is, this is for Parajanov a matter of aesthetic choice. And starting with Shadows, all of his later films are released only in the original language. Um, so Sayat um, Naval, Call of Pomegranate in Armenian, Legend of the Sarami Fortress in Georgian, and Ashik Karib in Azeri, uh, without uh, Russian subtitling. So if there would be sometimes a voice reading over, but no, uh, no dubbing of the uh, original spoken voices. They had to be heard. By contrast, that Vomazai Tsiami uh, was dubbed into Russian, and it's the uh, Russian dubbed version that um, remained very popular, which is, of course, a paradoxical thing because this is a, the original play and the film have very subtle play that is uh, with identities that are marked by different language choices. In the original Ukrainian language version, this was spoken Ukrainian versus Surzhik, a patois that makes us uh, uses primarily uh, Ukrainian phonetic features, but borrows uh, some things from Russian vocabulary and grammar. And what happened is, of course, if you watch the film in Ukrainian, and we have Ukraine, standard Ukrainian versus Surzhik, there is one type of language politics. Versus in the Russian dubbed version, they dubbed standard Ukrainian into standard Russian, and they kept Surzhik as Surzhik. And of course, for the Russophone audiences uh, who do not know better in many cases, this Surzhik, uh, the um, vernacular of uh, people who, of ambiguous social status wh whom the film satirizes, fed into the colonial stereotype of quaint Ukrainians who cannot learn proper Russian. So it had an absolutely reverse uh, pattern of what uh, the message was doing. So one and the same film, just because of the two different language versions in which it was released, ideologically sent very different messages. So what was happening then in the Ukrainian film industry as the Soviet Union was collapsing? Um, 
by and large, after independent Ukrainian cinema was crushed in 1973 when Parajanov was arrested and a lot of other filmmakers were fired from their position, uh, for most of the rest of the 70s and uh, early 80s, Ukrainian cinema uh, was in a situation that was very sad and precarious. Films were made mostly in Russian. Uh, they were very often of forgettable, mediocre quality. Uh, and the censorship was very, very heavy. However, what happened is, fascinatingly, we see attempts almost immediately to create something new and interesting, but they are paradoxically messy. Uh, the first attempt to dub Hollywood films in Ukraine come into Ukrainian come very late in 1989, and it is Romantic the Stone, which was already by this point dubbed in Russian and very successful as a Russian language dubbed version shown in Soviet film theaters. Uh, the politics of Soviet importation of Hollywood blockbusters, which films were and which films were not imported, uh, is a separate story of which we can talk about for a long time, but this is not my focus here. Ironically, though, Kiev already had a professional Russian language dubbing facility in Ukraine that was you know, working with foreign films. Kyiv also was the major center of making film copies uh, for distribution a, a uh, across the movie theaters of the entire country. The main uh, in Russian was in fact based in Kyiv for the entire Soviet Union. Uh, what the situation changes, uh, obviously, with the collapse of the Soviet Union and here with the arrival of piracy in the early 90s, no new official imports of Western films were happening uh, because of the embargo by Hollywood studios because of the widespread piracy. And uh, the domestic production finally begins uh, to recover in the mid-1990s However, the situation is still precarious in that uh, the economic situation is quite complicated. The film that had the greatest international success, A Friend of the Deceased, uh, which was bought uh, for US distribution and shown in theaters in this country, was an art house film made in Russia. You do not hear Ukrainian spoken there even though it is set in Kyiv. A very interesting case is the film Princess Anna Bobach, uh, uh, the Princess and the Beans, uh, which was made in both Russian language and Ukrainian language version, but for uh, mostly only the Russian language version was seen. There was one uh, really uh, ironic uh, case, which was actually the first uh, release, uh, premiere screening of the film in Odessa, where they mixed up the reels and 10 minutes of the film was in Ukrainian, in the middle of the film while the rest of it was in Russian. The funny thing is that the, main, the male protagonist, the actor dubbing in Ukrainian, because it was a Russian actor playing that role, had a much nicer sort of velvety Barry White style voice. So it really changed the dynamic when you heard it in Ukrainian as opposed to the actual voice of the actor that you heard in Russian. But in general, Film was a place where the situation remained very complicated and paradoxically where Russian language continued dominating in the 90s, early 2000s, even in art house innovative filmmaking. So this was an outlier paradoxical uh, trend within Ukrainian uh, culture and this brings filmmaking closer to mass media because in television and in newspapers and on the radio, in the 90s, early 2000s, the Russian language predominated. While in fine letters and in theater, most artistic innovative work was done in Ukrainian. In cinema, this uh, was completely not the case. Russian language was absolutely dominant in the product that was being produced in independent Ukraine. Until uh, we ha I mean, there were a few exceptions, but the film that really changed the trend was Mamai from 2003, a work of poetic cinema by a new generation of director Ove Sanin, uh, which deliberately is made in two languages, Ukrainian and Crimean Tatar. 
and it is based on the uh, folklore, you know, Ukrainian Dume and Crimean Tatar uh, songs and fairy tales, and is set in an undefined time during the Cossack age, so could be anywhere between uh, 14th and 17th century, but it was a very deliberate choice for the filmmaker not to have a Russian language heard on the screen. It was part of the aesthetic and ideological choice. In terms of articulating the political side of the language choice, the semi-stillborn, if I can put it that way, attempt to revive Ukrainian cinema in the wake of Orange Revolution uh, is an example of how not to do things right. So here are titles of two films that were released with great fanfare, Pomaranchova Nebo, Orange Sky, and Orange Love, which was released even with this funny title even in Ukrainian and in Russian. And in both films, what happens is that we have uh, a, a male protagonist who is Russian speaking, and in Orange Love there is a Ukrainian woman who is Ukrainian speaking, so she sort of converts him to the Ukrainian cause through the intimate relations. And in this film, we have a choice. We have a triangle between a Russian speaking girl and a Ukrainian speaking girl. And the <laughs> Russian speaking girl, of course, is crassy and oligarchy, and the Ukrainian speaking girl is idealistic and progressive and a revolutionary. And our young man, who comes also from a position of privilege, and there is his fancy limousine, or his daddy's <laughs> fancy limousine. He is torn, but of course, you know, love and revolution help him out. Both films were done in not very successful ways, so this is one of the reasons why uh, they, were, they don't have long-term consequences, but it is, they're notable as an example of <laughs> filmmakers trying to grapple with the language question, but doing it in a very heavy-handed and not very well thought through fashion. So what happens shortly after the Orange Revolution, of course, is that the Ukraine gets into the situation of the so-called dubbing wars, uh, because the new progressive pro-Western Ukrainian government in January 2006 uh, issues a decree uh, on the switch of dubbing of film screening screened into in movie theaters in Ukraine into Ukrainian. It was of course not to be an overnight switch, but it had to be a gradual switch accomplished over several years. There was huge resistance, howls of outcry of protest, collective letters uh, by filmmakers and film distributors saying that this will kill Ukrainian film industry. Why do you think they did that? Primarily because most of them were working with the subsidiary companies in Moscow. So in other words, Hollywood studios or other uh, Western companies will sell rights for the entire you know, commonwealth of independent states, the post-Soviet countries, to a company in Moscow, and the company in Moscow would then negotiate rights for various other smaller, less important countries uh, in that scheme of things. So you continue the old uh, imperial hierarchies uh, reproduced in post-Soviet times. However, there were those who wanted to change that, and in this case in Ukraine, uh, the person who really spearheaded this was Bogdan Batruch, who was an ethnic Ukrainian born in Poland and he and his company, BNH, negotiated directly with Hollywood studios, both for uh, movies and for TV shows, and they dubbed them into Ukrainian, and they proved that it could be done very well. Uh, examples of that most famous ones would be the Disney uh, cartoon Cars, Tachke in Ukrainian, which was done very creatively in a really fun way, in terms of subtitling. And an example of, uh, on television, which is especially telling, is the TV show ALF, which was dubbed so well in Ukrainian that it became a cult hit. And uh, the Russian dub dubbed version of ALF 
is absolutely boring. And Alf is, I mean, some people really like this show, but I would say that's the greatest work of American television. <laughs> but thanks to the very creative dubbing of, uh, into Ukrainian, it did become a major hit, a sort of a cult favorite. And um, this also went against the grain of the enduring colonial stereotypes that the Russian language product is high class culture elite as opposed to a Ukrainian language product which is somehow mediocre and of lesser quality and of lesser importance. These prejudices are amazingly persistent and these of course successes prove them wrong the similar thing, of course, uh, the, dub the result of the dubbing wars is that the collapse of the industry did not happen. Um, during the Yanukovych years, the policy was uh, slightly modified but not abandoned. So as a result, uh, in each year, you know, more and more films were released, dubbed into Ukrainian. At this point, the figure is uh, in the high 80s uh, percent wise so this shows that uh, it is entirely possible to dub films in Ukrainian and people will go and watch Pirates of the Caribbean or other films and they'll be just fine but we have also examples of uh, challenging this and trying to go and bypass the whole language question and the tribe so far the Ukrainian film which has had gr the greatest <laughs> critical acclaim internationally, winning over 30 prizes at film festivals, uh, getting European Film Awards and others, uh, is a film that is filmed entirely in sign language, not subtitled for us, the hearing. It is Ukrainian sign language, but it is in some ways a giant middle finger for to everyone who is struggling with this issue. The film, is basically, as the director described it, is a Western set in a boarding school for the hard of hearing. The new guy comes to town, he falls in love with the girlfriend of the leader of the local gang, so he crosses you know, where he should not cross, and troubles arise. So this is our protagonist, our sort of new cowboy who rides into town. And uh, the, it's not the plot, but it's the acting, the setting, and how it was done. And amazingly, this was filmed during Yevromaidan. So the actors and the members of the crew would run back and forth from standing at the square chanting or participating in other protests and going to the area where the film was being shot. And its success of the film proved that language question can be approached in creative and unexpected ways. Another very interesting example is the sadly recently deceased uh, uh, Kira Muratova, uh, one of the greatest uh, filmmakers of the 20th century in the pro-Soviet period. And Muratova, who was born in Romania to a uh, ethnically Russian father and Romanian mother, grew up, of course, as a Romanian and Russian bilingual native speaker. So she was not fluent in Ukrainian. However, she lived in Ukraine since the early 1960s, so for over half a century of her life, and she understood the language very well. Most of her films were made entirely in Russian, but a Melodie de Charmanke, a melody for a barrel organ from 2009, was a major breakthrough in that in this film, language again plays symbolic role. We're still in the situation of non-accommodating bilingualism where some characters speak Ukrainian, some characters speak Russian, but the use of Ukrainian is highly important and the, none of the characters who speak Ukrainian are bad guys in the film. They have the proper moral core, whereas among the Russian speakers in the film, they are, of course, the children who are innocent, but most of the adults are corrupt and heartless. So the message that was, the film was sending with uh, the politics of its language use is very clear. And then, of course, what happened? In 2013, uh, just as Yevromaidan was going on and before the uh, Russian fomented separatist movement begins, the original Ukrainian language of Zadvomazaitsami 
considered lost was discovered in a storage facility in a movie theater in Mariupol in the Donbass region. So that was a major revelation. And now, of course, the film that uh, for several generations people only knew in the Russian plus Surzhik version, you can also watch and you can find easily on YouTube in the Ukrainian language plus Surzhik version. Unfortunately, it's not subtitled into English, so that's the problem. We now need to have the proper Ukrainian language version with good English subtitles. But it, as I note here, uh, led to a really remarkable wave of soul searching. So what is happening in Ukrainian cinema now? We have this wonderful group of upstarts called Suk, Suchasno Ukrainske Kino. This is not the only a group that is making new and interesting films, but a very important and a very active one. And both the young rebels of Suk and the older filmmakers uh, really revel now in experimentation. Over the past five or six years, basically roughly with the start of the Euromaidan, we have a new wave of amazing creativity in Ukrainian cinema. Some of it is a consequence of the revolution and the troubles and the challenges that it brought in society. Other things simply happened by coincidence and that the new generation is coming of age, but this is a very happy and interesting combined uh, situation. Also, for a long time, there was the so-called lost generation of older Ukrainian filmmakers who uh, came of age in the early 1990s and uh, even though they were very talented and graduated from film school as very promising young directors, there was no work for them. Very often they had one film which was their graduation project and they ended up going into making commercials, uh, working in television, very often working in Russian television and things of that kind. So Miroslav Slaboshpitsky, uh, uh, the director of the tribe, is an example of that a generation. Olena Debianenko and Arkady Nepetaluk, two filmmakers trailers of whose films I'm going to show shortly are also members of that older generation. We also have a wonderful group of uh, people who, uh, who is led by Volodymyr Tichy, uh, who is the son of a dissident. Uh, his father uh, was a dissident who died in the Gulag in the Perm camps, and together with uh, Vasil Stus, he was reburied in Ukraine uh, shortly before the collapse of the Soviet Union. So Vladimir Tichy, his son, is a prolific film director who has done a lot of these anthology films where we have 10-minute episodes by different directors that he then puts together. He also is the leader of the Babylon 13 uh, project. And I encourage you to Google Babylon 13. This is a group of filmmakers, some of them documentary filmmakers, most of them original documentary filmmakers, who, when the Yevromaidan started happening, went around and tried a recording and creating witness work. And some of it just raw film, and others is then documentary films that are very creative. There could be examples of essay film, in the way the innovative essay film done by people like Harun Faroki or uh, others. And uh, some of these films are just as short as 20 seconds. Others are two hour long, so it's a very large body of work that is associated with Babylon 13 group. And so to give you an example of you know, a taste of what is happening in contemporary Ukrainian cinema and what the tendencies are, I will now play four film trailers. And fingers crossed that the technology will be cooperative. So the here is uh, the first trailer, Maya Babusa, Fanny Kaplan, my grandmother Fanny Kaplan, <laughs> a film from 2016. Okay. Fanny Kaplan, це ваше справжнє ім'я. There's a Slavoshpitsky playing Dmitry Ulyanov, Lenin's younger brother. He won Best Actor Prize in the Odessa Film Festival. Ну, одні лінії, два об'єкти. 
і ви намагаєтесь дивитись на дальній і ближчій. Міка! Міка! Ми стріляли. Ти впевнений, що це вона? Вікаря! А хто його зна? Що з нею тепер буде? Ти знаєш? Це вирішить ЦК! Жду розплющить очі. So, uh, for those of you who might not know, uh, Fanny Kaplan is the woman who, of course, allegedly uh, shot Lenin. Uh, which uh, led to uh, serious health problems of his and his relatively early death. The problem, and this is something that the film focuses on, is that she was legally blind. So it is not entirely certain whether she was the person who shot, shot Lenin. This film is a combination of an essay film set in the present and an alternative history reconstruction. Uh, Fanny Kaplan, and that is not her real name, that was the name was given to her with her fake revolutionary papers. Uh, she came from a Yiddish-speaking family in Kyiv. Uh, so for her, the first language was Yiddish. Uh, she was fluent in Russian. We do not know how much Ukrainian she spoke. Uh, we have scenes that happen in Kyiv we have things that happen in Moscow, we have things that happen in Crimea, which is where she's convalescing uh, after February 1917, which like many political exiles from Siberia, she is amnestied and brought back. And uh, the Siberian exile. The film is shot entirely in Ukrainian, including uh, as a deliberate choice. So this is an entirely Ukrainophone universe, whether it's Moscow or Siberia, or Kyiv or Crimea, we may guess that the characters are speaking Russian or Yiddish or another language, but in the film, they're speaking Ukrainian only. So this is one approach. And the film is very successful. As I said, it had, was a major festival hit, uh, got very good critical reception, and I encourage you to see it if you can. Here is the second film. This is by a member of Babylon 13 and Souk groups, Katarina Hormostai. Well, Nastai is a, a student of Marina Razbishkin, a prominent uh, Russian film director who is one of the major innovative forces in a documentary cinema. But again, this is a poetic essay film type of uh, documentary cinema as opposed to sort of newsreels. This is a fiction film, however. <laughs> So this is a film that is uh, 40 minutes long. It won a prize for the best short at the Odessa Film Festival in 2017. And then this is an entirely gynocentric space. We have five girlfriends just shooting the breeze, hanging out with each other, talking about things. Some things are very lighthearted, some things are very dramatic. In this film, of these five characters, Two speak Ukrainian the entire time, three speak Russian the entire time. So we again have non-accommodating bilinguals. They're friends, they're comfortable with each other, uh, the language choices do not separate them at all. And so you see Katerina Molchanov again, but she, 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 she's Russian speaking. So this is an attempt at uh, using language to portray realistically the situation where we had characters uh, dealing with uh, the complexities of uh, the situation. But in the titles everywhere, it's Ukrainian or for an international release, English. 
but some characters speak Ukrainian, some speak Russian, and the non-accommodating bilingualism situation continues. Next, and we're gonna go to switch to, so out tab, and we go to which, yeah, this should be Preputni, yes. Preputni, and let's play. So Preputni is in standard Ukrainian and Surzhik. This is the most extensive presence of Surzhik in uh, contemporary Ukrainian cinema. And it's sort of a journey to the heart of darkness, if you wish. It starts in a town in Nizhen, uh, which is associated, of course, with uh, Gogol, who holds young days, but also a major cultural center now, and going to a very godforsaken village whose name is Preputni, it's the real name of the village, but Preputni could also mean somebody who strayed, somebody who lost their way. Interesting thing here is the subtitles, because they tried to render in English the subtitles, and it, you will see if they were successful. I had no part of the subtitles, even though I actually know the scriptwriter. And this is Arkady Nikotelik, another one of those lost generation directors. Можете мне наконец-то сказать, зачем надо было ехать именно той дорогой? Ты уже полгода голову морочишь, девочка. Что ты думаешь, отбегительно столичная интеллигентка, да? Умно, образованно. А я грязный нижинский жлоб. Так, скажи, зараз выйдешь за меня за мужчину? Нет, вот тут то, зараз мне не скажи. Алло, Анатольчик, привет. Что, мы же сходим где-то прошвырнемся? Да, такие порты, что шутишь? Мужчина, нам нужно до припитки, точно. Так что тебе лучше будет, когда я блювану прямо в салоне? Тебе блювану. Я тебе сейчас блювану. Только сиденья почистим. Треба его срочно отправить в лекарню до Нижина. Ні, краще до Чернігова. Бо з Нижина не всі повертаються живі. Я доплачу тобі. 20 гривень доплачу. Я заплатю я тобі великі деньги. І я буду тобі говорити, хочу я швидко їхати чи медленно. Боже. Ну і кажеш, ти все-таки тупо. Що, грузим вещ? Ударь! 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 Я підвезу твоє ближче, а то бачу, не познає свій транспорт. All right, and now one more. And that would be... Uh, the film Dicke Pole. Please join a movement of six million Americans to impeach Donald Trump. Trump has <laughs> nine different impeachable offenses. Some of we all like to imagine. <laughs> okay, this is uh, this. <laughs> okay, so Dicke Pole uh, is a wonderful film uh, that is an adaptation of Sergei Zhadan's novel Voroshilov Hrak. Uh, Zadan's novel is, of course, uh, written in Ukrainian. It is set in the area of uh, northern half of the Luhansk Oblast, so it is more or less something which is a transition between Slobozhanshchina, which is a historic northeastern part of Ukraine, and Donbass, the industrial uh, coal mining region. The novel was released in 2010, so it's before the war, but obviously the film is released now, so it's covered by the context of the war. And in this film, the language policy is complicated in that there is both accommodating and non-accommodating bilingualism present. And this has caused huge controversy because some people said, no, the film should have been just in Ukraine. Они тебя били? Да никто меня не бил. Просто поговорили, подразили. Новые друзья? Ага. Хочет купить эту заправку. А ты продал бы? Продал бы. Ты ж слабак. Как я попрошу тебя отсмотать у меня? Не отмолвишь? 
Так, що ви вирішили? Саме цього вони і прагнули. Ти, сука, підпишеш чи ні, а? Всякі неправильні душі вигідно тримати вас за яйця. Взагалі ми, сука, розвод, коротше. А спроси мене, якого х**а? Я не відповідаю. Що це? Державний кордон. Ніколи не піддавайтеся спокусі. Пересікаю черту. Та яку таку черту? Красна. Странний мій народ місний. Знаєте, чого його леви не чіпали? Та тому, що він дихав вогнем. А вони думали, що це знак Господа. І боялися з ним зв'язуватися. Не будеш мати ні бізнесу, ні навушників, ні баби. I think it will be better to leave more time for discussion, so I hope that through this talk I was able to give you a panorama of the past context and some of the contemporary trends. Happy to talk more about them and look forward to your questions. Thank you so much. We have about, we have 20 minutes. Then. So I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about what you mean uh, by uh, creative subtitling, or sorry, creative dubbing, um, which I, I understand well from watching movies like Cars, for example, or actually you know, watching one of the Star Wars movies in a, in a theater in, in Petersburg where they had done a very artistically yeah. done, so it, it seemed quite almost as though the film had been shot in Russia. Um, but when you say ALF, that's where I have cognitive dissonance because I remember watching that show as a child and even then it wasn't particularly funny. Um, <laughs> you created that Alpha is funny. And that's, okay. and that's what I want to hear because I'm also thinking about an experience I had once uh, in the 90s in a hostel watching um, Seinfeld with the Lector in mm. Poland uh, uh, where every, it was the one voice, the one voice with monotone voiceover. Mm which of course is almost a surreal experience when you're watching a show like Seinfeld. And there was an older man in the same room who was looking at me laughing as though I was some kind of alien creature. Like he didn't understand what was going on because of the way it was presented. But what, do, what does it mean to do ALF creatively? Basically what happens is uh, it's the enthusiast. So in the case of uh, Ukrainian work, I mean, this was done not for commercial purposes, but even though they were happy to make money, but to prove. I mean, this is one of those uh, examples where people go the extra mile to say, we can do wonderful creative things and you will like it, damn it. And so Oleksandr Mihrabetsky is the person who was the leader of that team. And he is one of those people who delights in the quirkiness of the language and the playing with the registers, with bringing in dialectism, in coming at a lot, in having the text come, come alive. And when it is a labor of love, when sometimes it starts even with potentially mediocre original material, it uh, could work very well. I'm unfortunately drawing a blank on its title, but there was a, Western, uh, I think actually US made documentary about the professional dubbing industry in France, uh, Italy, and Germany, contemporary actors. And examples of how for certain, I mean, there are two different German actors, 
uh, both of whom uh, were considered the standard uh, voices for George Clooney. So what happens if you're used to one kind of German George Clooney and all of a sudden there's another kind of German George Clooney? For the German audiences, that this creates a certain cognitive dissonance. In the case of Ukraine, uh, what it was is that people were seeing films in Russian and then they, uh, that predisposed them to something and some sort of expectations. Uh, there was not as much work done well dubbed into Ukrainian, or at least when it was, it was usually TV shows, uh, mostly uh, soaps, American soaps, Turkish soaps, and it was just blob. So it had to be a generation of really excited uh, people, not all of them necessarily younger, some of them had been going at it for a long time, but the system was just holding them back. And they were able to do this wonderful creative work and it's the delight in finding, I mean, it's, it's almost, you know, treating it as a work of art, as serious literary translation, as opposed to a workman-like job for just getting the message across. So elevating, uh, I mean, that's a question of both the language and the voices. So we have the language, the translation, which was very skillfully done, and also then involving major local actors, which Disney does when, for instance, they do the Miyazaki cartoons in English. They often bring major actors uh, to uh, read those voices. So the same happened in Ukraine. And then you heard actors, who, local actors whom you do know, whom you do like speaking for some of those characters, and that helped. Yes? Thank you. It's really fascinating. I'm wondering if you can say a few words about regional diversity and about geography, because it's interesting that, I guess, you had two major centers in Kyiv and Odessa, right? And you, I think you only mentioned Kiro Muratov from Odessa, so what's going on there? And also with the film that you showed, I think all of them take place in Kyiv or east of Kyiv, right? And what happens west? Okay, uh, let me see if I can find the trailer for Husul Ksenia, which is a film has just been released, and I think everyone will enjoy it. So we'll just go to here, and we'll go to, we'll just do a search. Uh, like we'll do Google search. There, there, the there, there, bar right there. On the right. Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah, underneath. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, sorry, it's just looking. Uh, let's do, okay, well. Because this is a, uh, movie. Yes, that's what we want. We don't want the song. We want the <laughs> movie, and uh, we want the videos. We want the trailer. Uh, trailer, trailer, not trailer, trailer. Trailer. I need to spell, of course. Okay. Oh, why? Why is it? Okay. If you go back to the results that you showed, if you scroll down, there was a tweet that's in the trailer. Oh, the tweet? Yeah. Okay. So check out the trailer. Yeah. There it is. Scroll. Scroll one more. more. Yeah. There. Okay. Okay. <sighs> Why is full screen not available? If you press the YouTube, you can watch yeah. my Я Микола Даделюк розпоряджую цим, що все моє майно рухоме і нерухоме, вартості понад мільйон доларів переходить на власність мого сина Ярослава. Але під умовою, що він поїде до старого краю і там одружиться зі свідомою українкою. So 1938, Yes, Katya Volchadova, yes. And that she's really good. She's in a minor room. Слухай, Ядько, що ти думаєш про жінок? Властиво. Мені б'ється або істину героїчне серце. Він американець. Я 
Іванець, світла людина, з іншою душею, з іншими поглядами. У нього нема української душі. Там в Америці я мав одну душу, а приїхав сюди, я почуваю, що маю дві. А ти поїхала за мною до Америки? Ви що, маєте там ґрунт і хату? Мамо, не роби такого страшного обличчя, бо виглядаєш як здушено гірок. На себе подивись. Рекламу я зробив прекрасну, чисто по-американськи. Так що, скоро про нас вас знаю. This is uh, the whole story of the presence or absence of Western Ukraine in cinema is actually a point of major concern in that uh, in Soviet days there were no film studios based in Western Ukraine. So uh, the discovery of Western Ukraine by filmmakers in the 1960s was mostly filmmakers not from the region going there and in some ways falling into tropes of uh, cliches of exoticism. Parajanov's Shadows of Forgotten Ancestors being an example of that. But we then have an interesting and easy combination of local talent who is involved and outsiders. So we have these very complex hybrid situations. In terms of contemporary film industry, the old Soviet era studios are all but collapsed. So you have now independent production companies that are highly mobile. The Odessa Film Studio mostly is a site for having pavilion work or renting out talent. Uh, one of my best childhood friends is uh, Zvuk Operator, uh, so he's a recording, a sound recording engineer who travels with a lot of shows. Up until the Revolution of Dignity, most of the people who are coming to Odessa Film Studio to use its facilities were Russians who were doing B-movie grade work uh, TV shows for children and things of that kind. That was the only employment uh, my friend Victor was getting. So from him, I sort of have this inside track to, you know, from the ground, how things look. And uh, in Kyiv uh, also, it's no longer the studio there. Are, it's all these new production companies that now dominate it. And many, most of them are based in Kyiv, but they draw on people from, uh, all the different parts of Ukraine. So what we see in a cinema now is, uh, as in other aspects of Ukrainian society, with the earlier regional divides and what in the Soviet uh, context was known as Moskovsky Polisos, so Moscow is a vacuum cleaner that pulls all the talented people from all over the Soviet Union, uh, and then people in other parts of the country, even within one uh, country, you know, like Ukraine, no longer talk to each other. And this is not even a question of language. Even if you are Ukrainophone or Russophone, people from Lviv would not necessarily know what people in Cherkasy would be doing. And similarly, people from uh, Donetsk would not know what people in Kharkiv were doing. So there was a fragmentation which it has been bridged or is being bridged, but being bridged very well, I think, and building a lot of horizontal ties uh, through diff many different cultural initiatives in Ukraine, uh, by writers, by theaters, by filmmakers. So in this sense, the trends are very positive, I would say. Can you say something about the group uh, that uh, produced Mif and also Ludina na Taburetti? I haven't seen the films, but I'm just curious. Uh, I am not sure. I mean, these. Uh, um, Okay, do you remember the name of anyone in, uh, involved? No, Mif is about the uh, opera singer in Paris who goes to the war and he's oh, killed. Yes, uh, there is a boom of documentary cinema and uh, there are basically two different trends. One is uh, uh, work uh, that continues in the old sort of Soviet made-for-TV documentaries, which Ukraine was a very strong center of 
because Kiev uh, Nauk Film, the Kiev Studio of Popular Science Films, was the main center for the entire Soviet Union for making popular science educational documentaries, uh, which were mostly released in Russian, but often released in two languages. So Ukraine has a lot of old know-how of how to make these very old-fashioned, but you know, fairly creative films. And then there is the young upstarts who are trying to engage with innovative work, uh, whether it's uh, Razbeshkina and her studio, and Katya Hornostai is an example of that, or at this point, it's uh, the young people uh, coming under Volodymyr Tichy as uh, tutelage and coming of age. So there is a proliferation of uh, work. And also, of course, we have the technical changes. You can now shoot a high quality film basically with a good smartphone. You no longer need to have the huge technological apparatus that for most of film's existence really uh, restricted what you were available to do. So there is now a lot of this from the ground up citizen filmmaking. So in other words, we have something like Werth of Utopia because Werth, of, of course, famous in his theoretical work, thought that all the people will be creative of you know, content. People will be filming things all the time and uploading. Of course, he thought of himself as an authority, as an intellectual, who would then edit things together as opposed to uh, people who sort of review things on Facebook or uh, whether the videos uh, or Tumblr or whatever, whether the videos uh, hold up to community standards or whatever, the various companies uh, doing that kind of work are doing. So we have a paradoxical thing where instead of an intellectual, ambitious, modernist, utopian project, we have you now commercial sort of internet era companies who are exercising this kind of control. But even they cannot control everything. So we still have. Uh, surges of creativity that pop up here, there, and everywhere. Do you understand? I had a question about how these films um, are subtitled when they go abroad. Because um, I'm thinking of Agnieszka Holland's film In Darkness, mm -hmm. which was shot, uh, you know, with Ukrainian and a slang or patois, mm -hmm. uh, and in Polish. Yeah, you know, Gwara, the Lviv yes. patois, yeah. And mm -hmm. I, mm. when you see it in English, you it flattens completely what's going on because the, the someone who doesn't even hear that there's a different languages spoken doesn't understand or misses completely the story of different ethnic groups and within ethnic groups, classes. So I was, I mean, to me, it was like a, a very good example of a, a very bad or 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 sad uh, subtitling. Um, I was wondering if you have seen films where the subtitling was actually taking seriously the ideology that was passed down by doing this. Com what do you call it? Competitive, or mm -hmm. the, you know, Russian. The what do you call that? No, non-accommodating bilingual. Non this yeah. is this is a challenge, and uh, this is something that goes back to. How do you render dialects of ancient Greek, sort of Doric versus Attic, and you know things of that kind? But and not quite, because they can <laughs> still, you know, register the yes. language that people use and that are meaningful. Absolutely, so. absolutely. Uh, and what happens is, unfortunately, mostly it is not done well. Uh, mostly, this is flattened uh, in translations as in the case of uh, Agnieszka Holland's film. Preputni uh, is a good example, but in this case, uh, this was the uh, scriptwriter himself who has very good command of English. Uh, he was seeking to do that, and he th later, after it was already released, he asked me because you know, he was a bit worried, do you think I did an okay job? Um, and I think that uh, he did do a good job, even though this is, of course, Western slang. And uh, in his case, it also became sort of mid-Atlantic in the sense that there is some of it is British, some of it is an American. And, uh, but he made a very serious effort 
Uh, so I hope when you're watching the trailer for Preputni, you saw that mm -hmm. it was trying to make uh, the speech colorful. Because uh, with uh, Surjak, of course, there we see a social status. Mm -hmm. And so it's uh, similar to regional accents in British English, which now people do not hide under RP, but uh, emphasize their diversity. And uh, you hear those diverse voices and diverse accents in television programming and things of that kind. So there are, there is a discourse about reclaiming, positive reclaiming of Surjak, and that it's not, not something that has to be stigmatized. In this case, uh, the film is not ideologically judgmental. It's trying to present us all the characters in a sympathetic way, even though it is a very, very dark, sort of tragic comedy with the emphasis on the tragedy. It seems, the trailer looks funnier than the film. The film is actually quite disturbing, but very well done. Uh, it remains a problem. It's something that uh, people continue struggling with. Uh, with cinema as just as they do in literature when this kind of diversity of registers and diversity of voices is maintained. And I'm sure Ben would second me on that, is that this is something for which there is no easy solution, but we keep trying. So there's no question. standard way of representing the non-standard? Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes, sir. Hmm. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, great information that you just provided. Mm -hmm. I have, uh, I'm, I'm curious about the, um, to which extent European cinema is now kind of uh, uh, have collaborated with production companies from Europe and the US. You mean it, it always comes with like different ideas, the values that are infiltrated into the, into the national cinema, whether it's good or bad. I, I just want to know your opinion. And if, if it's happening with Ukrainian cinema at this point, you know the, oh, the, well. the one. But for example, for example, I found um, uh, um, there is a there is a Russian movie, the old Soviet movie called "We Are from Jazz." Me is mm -hmm. and on the internet, this there was some information that there was a big, big scale project, like maybe five to seven years ago, starting in Ukraine to do the sequel to this called "We Are from Jazz 2. Well, and the Soviet like, sequel, they like, were now going to do Brat 3. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it, was, it was Ukrainian production, but it never, as far as I understand, it, never, it was never finished, never fulfilled, you know? So to which extent it's, uh, all these ties are now getting, you know? Okay, well, this is a great example. Woman at War is an Icelandic Ukrainian co-production. The first ever, a wonderful film. It just entered movie theaters in the US. Go see this film, it's amazing. Uh, there is no American influence. I mean, American uh, Hollywood occasionally poaches directors. They just poached uh, Slavoj Pitsky to film some sort of action film script that is set uh, in the Far East and Zeleny Klin, as it's known in Ukrainian, but I don't think it's going to be a high art work. It's just like, you know, they bring indie filmmakers to direct superhero movies. Uh, so whether it's dom domestic within the U.S. or bring, bring foreign talent, it's a very similar kind of pattern. There is a very serious involvement uh, and dialogue with film industries of other countries, but it mostly happens through a transparent grant system. Uh, so there is grant funding available uh, through the European Union, through the national film agencies. There is a festival in Cottbus in eastern Germany, uh, which really is a major showcase of work of up and coming East European filmmakers, including Ukrainian filmmakers. And the success of the Cottbus showcase often uh, leads to grant funding. So this is something that continues uh, from the early 90s, where uh, France, Germany, Sweden, they were the leaders, I would say, in terms of uh, providing funding uh, for filmmakers in uh, post-Soviet countries and making sure that they would continue working and being active. Uh, they did a lot with Russia. Uh, they no longer really do that with Russia except for filmmakers who now live outside Russia or do most of the work outside Russia, uh, such as Sakurov or Zvedintsev or 
a multi-country, multilingual director like Sergei Woznitsa, who was born in Belarus, carries a Ukrainian passport, used to work in Russia, and lives in Germany. And whose film Donbass was Ukraine's submission for the Oscars this year. Uh, one question. Uh, sorry, very, very one last question. Yes, anyway. very brief question. Very brief question. Financial model for movies made in Ukraine for Ukrainian audience is it <coughs> mostly financed by advanced sales, or uh, does the government subsidize movies? How much? What percentage of revenues come from ticket sales? Uh, well, it's still changing. I mean, there was no uh, state financing a film until two or three years ago, so it was mostly shoestring or dependent on Western grants. Derskino, the state film agency, have really started a very ambitious program. Also, uh, after scandals because of non-transparent distribution, now is a transparent application for grants. There's also the Ukrainian Culture Fund, which is a multinational endowment for the arts that just started last year. I was actually one of the experts evaluating the proposals uh, in the film uh, area, and the, some of the proposals were very good. Uh, Husulka Ksenia just made its first million in, through ticket sales. So it's an example of a film that is ambitious, fun, and also commercially successful, but still, in terms of uh, financial success, it's not Hollywood. It's still films that depend on investments that they recoup, but they're not necessarily make huge money. But the, it, so it continues having enthusiasm, but international festival acclaim often helps. So let's hope that things will stay positive in this case. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.